Hello everyone, I'm Tiki Fullerton from The Australian and welcome to the Commonwealth Bank's first CEO Business Forum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. I'm coming to you from Sydney and I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Well, thank you for joining us here at the Forum. For the last four years, Matt Common, the CEO of Commonwealth Bank, has written to customers to give them an update about the actions the bank has taken to support them and their community throughout this incredible year. Given the critical roles that businesses play in securing Australia's future economic prosperity, this year, Matt wrote specifically to business and small business customers about the tailored support the bank has provided. Well, Matt and Mike Vasey-Lyle, who leads the Business Bank, also wanted to give business customers a way to ask questions and give feedback. Well, that's what this virtual business forum is all about. Hundreds of business customers have registered to watch the forum and have shared questions, comments, complaints and other feedback. The bank's customer relations team has already begun following up with customers to help investigate and resolve complaints and issues. Now, given the number of questions received, uh, we may not be able to answer each and every individual question in the hour that we have together here at the forum. So we've grouped the questions together uh, that we've received into themes, and I'll be posing several of your questions from each of these areas to Matt and Mike, so you can hear what they have to say about it all. I'll do my best to get through as many of your questions uh, and get them all answered as, as I possibly can. Uh, there's no holes barred. There are some compl complaints in here. So let's get started. Uh, Mac, Matt and Mike, welcome. Uh, and uh, perhaps you'd like to make a couple of opening remarks, Matt. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you uh, for coming along, Tiki, and hosting us. And both Mark and I are delighted uh, to be here. And, and like you, I sort of want to briefly also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting today. As Tiki said, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. I also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, whilst we'd love to be able to do this in person with many of our customers, we, we really look forward to the opportunity, obviously, to engage. And as you said, uh, such an important part of the economy at any point in time, but also I think particularly as part of the economic response and recovery, we've been very focused on supporting businesses, particularly over the last 18 months. And you know, it's a huge credit to the resilience uh, and spirit of so many Australian businesses who've been able to withstand you know, some very challenging circumstances and things that have been completely outside of their uh, control. And you know, we really look forward to the opportunity to be able to engage. As you said, we're going to try and answer as many of those questions uh, as possible. And we're looking forward to being able to move from a I guess an environment where a lot of it has been support over the last 18 months and particularly early on in COVID we were able to put 80,000 or so of our business customers into loan deferrals but as we're coming out of lockdown and we're seeing the economic recovery start to accelerate and I think we should be all looking forward to a, a good 2022 both on uh, the personal as well as economic front lots of uh, I think freedoms and uh, just confidence coming back and so we you know, appreciate the opportunity, of course, to serve all of our business customers and look forward to the next hour. All right. Well, here, here to that in terms of the recovery. But uh, I haven't seen this done before, Matt, actually, um, this sort of interactivity, uh, particularly with small businesses. What are you hoping to get out of it, do you think? Well, I think for us, it's, of course, the opportunity to engage. And in the days pre-COVID, uh, of course, we'd have uh, functions and meetings and, and often events with uh, business customers. And we've had uh, customer forums, but we, I think, cognizant with the amount of focus that we've got on supporting Australian businesses, we wanted to set up you know, a dedicated uh, business forum. And hopefully next year, we'll be able to do that in person in a uh, with customers in the room, but we just think it's a good opportunity to hear back from customers. And, and, and as you said, that some of that uh, hopefully is positive, and also there's you know obviously things on people's minds. Sometimes it's product innovations. Sometimes it's th things that they're seeing that we're not currently meeting the mark. I think it's a very good discipline for for me, for Mike, and for the rest of the team. And we're here to serve our customers, mm. and so for us, it's a, an opportunity to hear what's on their mind and re, you know respond to that. And of course, you know I feed. 
that feed that into the things that we're thinking about uh, in the years ahead about how we can continue to improve the proposition that we're delivering for our clients. Right. And Mike, for you, I mean, obviously part of your job is to go out to meet and greet customers all the time. Uh, are you getting the feeling that there's a little bit more mojo out there with the, with the recovery on the way? Absolutely, Tiki. The, the level of confidence at the moment is, um, is, has really returned. So, and it's, it's so heartening to see it. it's, a, it's a national sense of co confidence now. Um, it's not patchy. It's not just Queensland. It's now, it's now across Australia that we've, we've seen this, this, this level of confidence return, which is really exciting. Yeah. Well, let's get into these, some of these questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention some names as well. This is from Akinyemi, and uh, really, it is a big one, and this is all part of just the, the business of business, if you like. This is a big one about inflation, mm. Matt. Uh, now, he says, how will the short and long-term impact of inflation, inflation in the U.S. affect Australia, and what should individuals and small businesses do now and, and later. I guess, yeah, the question is what's going on over there and indeed what's going on in Australia about inflation? Yeah, I mean, big topic has been for some time and, and particularly I think over the last few weeks, uh, we've seen big movements in both inflation expectations, economic recovery in many developed markets around the world. And of course, you know, as Mike said, we're feeling some of that confidence translating uh, domestically. There's been more robust economic data uh, locally as well. Obviously, the vaccination rollout has been hugely successful. Mm. And so I think if you look at the US and you look at the economic growth that's there, the Fed's basically said they'll finish tapering some of their bond purchases or otherwise known as quantitative easing. Most people expect they'll start lifting interest rates in the US, which obviously sets the tone for many markets, uh, in probably about the third quarter of next calendar year. Uh, as it relates to Australia, there's, there's clearly some differing views. Now, it's important to say that the governor of the central bank uh, who sets uh, the well, cash rate. he's got rate. a differing view from the view that he had just a little while ago. <laughs> he, he does, but to be fair to him, he's also responsive to... I mean, it's a good problem to have. If we're lifting rates earlier than he'd first forecast, that means economic growth is, has rebounded more strongly. The labour market's... Uh, you know, unemployment's very low, and he's seeing the sort of inflation pressure and wage growth that he's been looking for for many years. And so he's saying that's late 2023. Yeah. Our economics team thinks that's November 2022, to be precise. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, we, we're forecasting a very strong uh, calendar year next year of, um, you know, four and a half percent GDP growth. We think unemployment will be about four percent. And so, what does that mean? It means uh, with inflation and steepening of yield curves or outlook for interest rate expectations, this is an ideal time. And I know, you know Mike's been very focused on that to be talking to businesses around how to think about interest rate exposure. There's obviously for many customers as well, there's important considerations around currency mm -hmm. uh, as well. And so, of course, banks and bankers, our bankers are there to help customers think about that. But I, I do think that we're certainly coming towards the, the end of a, what has been a very, very low interest rate cycle. And I, we believe rates will rise very slowly. So it's not like we're going to be you know, going to a... Uh, you know, 3.5% cash rate. Well, yeah. our economics team think it'll be about to about 1.5%, but from 10 basis points, which is, of course, record low, yes. uh, that's, a, you know, that's a reasonable increase. Now, how do you reckon small businesses in particular should think about taking on new employees? Because we're, we're going to be growing now, as mm -hmm. you say, the recovery's coming. But we've got this weird situation with the borders where we've got wages pressure now and also it's quite challenging to find the right people, I think, for a lot of businesses out there. So should they wait um, until more people come back into Australia or how should they be looking at this, do you think? Yeah, look, I think it's an extremely challenging uh, labour market and certainly the key feedback from our clients, uh, both business and institutional, pre-lockdown was how hard it was to get skills uh, resources or to, you know, to hire employees, both in, you know, some of the traditional areas where we'd rely on migrant labour and areas like agriculture, as well as in skilled and, of course, our migration, which has been, you know, I think a very positive both social and economic force for Australia for many years. We've gone into net overseas uh, migration over the last 12 months. Mm. I think the reality is, well, you know, we, we expect certainly business and consumer confidence to continue to pick up. We think the labour market when unemployment will reduce quite sharply. It's not quite clear yet at what rate we'll need, we'll be able to bring in uh, migration. I think it's going to absolutely be important. Um, 
certainly if, if I representing the, the central bank, they'd certainly be saying don't wait. I mean, one yes. of the things I think people worry about, there's not enough wage inflation because, you know, businesses are reluctant to take on a higher cost base, which I'm sure we all appreciate. But I, I do think it's, there's going to be upward pressure on, on wages. And, and, of course, it puts the onus on all of us uh, to be hugely focused on keeping our best people because it's yeah. a very tight labour market and we're seeing you know, demand for specialist skills, but skills more broadly to be highly sought after. Yes. Uh, a specific business question here on procurement. Now, Roger says, uh, you say you're supporting small businesses and yet I was a preferred provider to the CBA uh, until you changed your systems and went with national firms rather than small ones. He says, how does using national firms demonstrate support for small businesses? Yeah, and look, we should follow up specifically on Roger's question, Mike, you feel free to add. I mean, obviously our posture overall is we want to uh, use suppliers that, that bank with us and, and that's, you know, obviously helpful. We really appreciate them supporting us and, and, and we want to do that on both sides. I think we're also very focused about, um, you know, one of the value propositions that Mike's really worked on is bringing the strength of our retail customer base to our business customers, and so we're working on a number of different ways to do that. You know, everything from profiling different businesses, because we're fortunate we've got a very large retail bank. We serve uh, about 10 million uh, Australians, and so that's a, it's a good audience for many businesses, but uh, we certainly are focused on making sure that um, customers that are doing uh, the bank with us where, where we can, and we've got the need for that uh, supply, then we, we tend to try and pick from that obviously not at all times can we can we do that but we're certainly very open to that feedback yeah thanks Matt I mean we certainly will follow up with Roger but um, as, as a rule we generally when, we, when we're looking for different categories of spend we will absolutely look in our client base first that is definitely one of our one of the one of our stated uh, approaches mm -hmm. but we will we will absolutely follow up on on Roger's Roger's um, OK, because there were a couple of, couple of questions mm. along there. But um, moving on, another really important one about cash flows, which is so important for, 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 for every business, as we know. But uh, Steve says there's, with all the variations in cash flow from so many small business, businesses, what will the CBA put in place to assist business who are struggling with being able to prove solvency for financial support? You should talk about that because yeah. we've had a real focus on, you know, particularly during COVID, how to think yeah. about that and coming out. Yeah. I think, uh, so as, as Matt said, we, we've, been, we've been amazed at how resilient business actually has been. But um, the one thing that we have done, Tiki, is um, we've been very conscious of this COVID period. So when we assess um, serviceability and the level, of, the level of lending to a business, we, we, we pretty much go pre-COVID. We have a look at performance pre-COVID. We carve out the, the COVID months. Um, and we assess the business on its performance pre this, pre this particular, the, the, the setbacks that have happened. So that's been a, that's been a, a, a cons approach that we've consistently applied across the business. We also uh, are very much moving, our, our stated ambition is to move away from just looking at fixed collateral type of lending and be looking at other types of collateral now. Well, this is, this is a big story, isn't it? Because um, in, in the past, businesses had to have a house or, or an or asset a that they could building. throw up. And, and in part, um, people I've spoken to have said, well, it's because the bankers just haven't taken the time to get to understand our businesses. It's a, it's a big change in direction for us, um, one that I'm particularly excited about. Um, it is a, a different way of dealing with customers. You really have to have a deep understanding of your customer's business, which is actually what banking is about. So it's, it's actually a, it's a really exciting development here in CBA and one that the, the relationship managers are relishing the new conversations that they're having with customers. Yeah, and has Matt great. given you the resources to, to go out there and do it? Absolutely, yes. Full, full support. All right. well, I think one of the things that's been interesting for us, Dickie, is, um, you know, we had a very supportive posture around the recovery uh, of the Australian economy over the last 12 months. And that's why we've just come through our, well, our full years, uh, 30 June. But that's our best year of, uh, of business banking and business lending ever, which sort of seems counterintuitive given the, uh, some of the economic difficulties. But I think we've really demonstrated and, you know, through the capability of the team, we've been able to, you know, support businesses back businesses that we know will be successful over the over the medium term and you know that's worked very successfully f for us and you know we think that's a big part of 
of our purpose as an organisation and a huge focus and opportunity to be able to support so many Australian businesses. What about uh, wait times? I mean, look, there are a couple of uh, comments in here, frustration over how long it's taken to get a response. I mean, Trevor's here. He says, uh, what can be done about wait times when attempting to make telephone contact with the bank through its call centres? And the music that gets played, because he's not very happy with the music. Um, in my view, such wait times give rise to service that can only be described as, he says, abysmal, and the music is painful. We'll have to look into the music, because I appreciate that uh, comment from personal experience with other uh, situations. But, look, I think at the heart of that is, at, at points in time over the last 12 months, uh, some of our customers had to wait too long. And to, to me and to Mike, that's unacceptable, and we certainly apologise for that. And so by no means as an excuse, but by way of explanation, it, at various points in time, we've really been trying to move big parts of our workforce to support uh, customers. I mean, in particular, uh, on the onset of COVID, uh, both last year and then again this year to a lesser extent. I mean, putting, um, you know, more than 80,000 customers into deferral, then obviously communicating, talking to them about what support coming out of those uh, deferrals. A lot of proactivity. I mean, we did tens of thousands of calls uh, to customers in the, the just the most recent, um, I guess, June to... October in New South Wales, slightly later in, uh, in Victoria lockdowns, you know, as, con as construction, as an example, as the sector was closed down. So we, we've tried to be really focused on very targeted support to the customers who we thought needed us most. That has left us at times shorter staff than we would have liked. If we would have had our time again, we would have made sure that we didn't blow out some of those uh, wait times. So as I said, I do apologise for that. I think we have that um, situation, uh, you know, much more under control and you know, Mike and the team are extremely focused on, on serving our customers well, both, you know, remotely, but of, of course, uh, you know, in person. Well, I'm going to drill down a bit here because there are two or three questions just like this and also related to the branches. Uh, I mean, Elizabeth here says, how do you make it so hard to do business with you? We own a couple of stores in Sydney and we're trying to get set up an FPOS facility, uh, she says, for a new business. We need to set up a business identity ID at our local branch, but no one answers the phone. We've left detail messages messages to try and set up and over a week later we've still had no response she says well on that one in particular we should definitely follow up to and find out the branch and i'll let you know mike talk more about with you know building out uh, an added business bankers into branch but i mean the the way the the phone works in the branch is it's basically uh, goes to the branch manager's mobile phone number and certainly our expectation of course they can be busy but you know there's a uh, facility to leave a message and we certainly should have gotten back to the the customer I mean no later than within 24 hours so if they've been waiting for a week to call back that's so that's 24 up. hours is what customers yeah, we would be would, able to expect we would expect it to be same day there might be circumstances it could be sort of later in the day and there might be a lot of other things but you know there's a we recognise that that's an important, we obviously have contact centres, uh, you know, a centralised service, but there are reasons why customers need to be able to go into the branch or they might make, uh, need to make an inquiry. So we certainly expect that level of responsiveness. But, you know, Mike, you should talk a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of the branch network to, to service our, our business customers. The branch network remains an incredibly important contact point for, for all of our customers, not just retail, but our business customers too. Mm. Um, and we've, we've invested over the last 12 months, we've added more than 130 new bankers into uh, the retail network. We've obviously put those bankers as close to business activity as possible. It's critical that we near our customer. Um, we are in more than 250 branches now um, with a dedicated business banker in that branch. Um, and the idea is, um, Tiki, is that that business banker can solve the customer's needs. That they're not just an order taker. That we want them to have the right tools that they can assist the customer, whether it be merchants, yeah. uh, 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 home lending, business lending, right there in the branch. Yeah. And That's you want the mantle of the business bank in Australia, don't you? And the, and the competition is souping up. You've got new new banks as well as, you know, the traditional banks. Bank. So there's a, there's quite a lot of competition out there at the moment in business banking, which it? is which is excellent. It's all it's 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 making us better, which is and we welcome competition. All right. Well, let's move to lending, which obviously is such an important uh, part of of CBA's business. Uh, here's one from Eric. Matt, where do you see interest rates travelling across the next five years? <laughs> well, I guess at the one of the earlier questions, Dicky. I mean, I think the. The reasonable expectation based on the outlook for 
for stronger economic growth is that you know and the you know, bond market and uh, yields are already reflecting that their people's expectations on interest rates are they will rise this as I said earlier clearly a disconnect about the the rate uh, and the market is sort of betting rates are going to rise uh, faster than central banks are saying around uh, around the world um, but we've obviously coming through a very disruptive um, and difficult period, and you know, we've seen some extraordinary monetary policy uh, globally, from you know, quantitative easing and basically zero interest rates, and in some parts of Europe, n you know, negative interest rates. So I think we're sort of in uncharted territory about what that economic recovery exactly looks like, and I think mm -hmm. some of that debate centres on central banks, and central bankers aren't convinced that some of the inflation and price pressure that we're seeing at the moment, if whether it's transitory, uh, whereas I think a lot of CEOs, both domestically and internationally, think it's going to be persistent. And so therefore, there's maybe a little bit of a, of a difference. But I mean, clearly, our economics team thinks interest rates will rise, as I said earlier, uh, at the back end of next year. But I mean, importantly, we don't see it going up rapidly. Or I just, yes. um, as I said earlier, I, I, our team sort of seeing a one and a half percent cash rate, which is you know a reasonable increase from ten basis points where we are now. But you know, it wasn't that long ago where we you know had a cash rate in the threes and uh, four percent. So obviously you know you add uh, additional um, to that, and you get to what customers would otherwise be expecting. Clive uh, says. Clive says here, what should, how can we best prepare for an increase in borrowing costs? Well, I think the most important thing is uh, a to be thinking about it and factoring it, it in. And uh, as I said, I know Mark and the team are very focused on. It's the sort of thing to be having a conversation with your banker about. You know, what's the outlook? What what are my uh, capital and lending needs? You know, what's my plan for the business? And I think you know one of the things we're very focused on. And I think it's a goes to the point you were making about competition. One of the good things is, you know, there's a lot of, I think, innovation in the service model. And clearly, we're wanting to expand the way we serve customers and not just relying on uh, sort of secured lending. And so there's a range of different products uh, and capabilities. And, you know, the job of a bank, as Mike said, is for bankers to understand the business and add value. Yeah. And part of that is, is planning for things like changes to interest rates, to uh, exchange rates and making sure that you know businesses are, are well prepared for that. I, I've no doubt after the last 18 months, many businesses are sort of thinking through their contingency mm -hmm. plans, having all of us having had to deal with things that we would never have anticipated. So, you know, it shows the resilience of many of those businesses. So we've got a specific one from Millen here, and this is around, well, what the RBA is doing with interest rates, and then quite separately, what the banks would do. Uh, mm -hmm. with interest rates because obviously that the, the two are related but and they go I'm a, a small business owner and have received finance from CBA the rates provided for finance were very competitive but it's it has renewed now and my interest rates has drastically gone up initially it was 4.68 but on renewal it's gone up to 5.02 why is this you happy to take it, Mark? Yeah, I'll, I'll happy to take it. So, uh, as Matt said, uh, we've already seen that the yield curves move. Um, our cost of funds have moved up. Um, so it's 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 a, it's a factor of where the, the market pricing for debt is right now. Yeah. Um, we always consider that every customer is priced on. Our, we have our cost of funds, and then obviously we assess the credit risk uh, associated with that particular business. So it would it would most likely in this instance be an increase in the cost of funds. And do you, I mean, are you sort of weighing up? We've got a potentially an interest rate cycle on the turn now, but also you've got your own support relationships with specific businesses. So you, <clears throat> presumably you're balancing changes to rates in that context. We are, and, and look, as Mike was alluding to, there's some products that are priced off the cash rates or there's a bigger dependence on that. There's others that are priced directly out of um, the wholesale markets. And so sort of the interest rate expectations actually drives uh, the pricing uh, quite considerably. So sometimes you can have, as we're seeing now, rises in, in rates. And we're seeing the same with uh, uh, fixed rates on home loans mm. that are actually increasing in anticipation of the official cash rate because that's effectively what we're going out and borrowing. Uh, at that prevailing rate. So you start to see that pressure at the moment on on prices before the cash rate. That's really the markets, the bond markets, and also where we go and borrow, really anticipating uh, that prices are going to, to increase. So here's a more specific one. Jennifer says, 
It also goes to timing. Jennifer says, I'm interested to know how the bank plans to adequately resource its discharge of mortgage and PEXA settlement teams to become more responsive to customer needs. She says, at the moment, the discharge of mortgage team fails to provide information, including indicative payout figures, in a timely manner. Settlements team leave everything to the last minute, she says, uh, often only loading required information 10 minutes before settlement and causing settlement delays. Yeah, that, that's uh, unusual. So we should definitely follow that up. I mean, from our perspective, um, it's been a very busy uh, time in home lending. And so that's the, the settlement and discharge process of a home loan, which is done on uh, PEXA, which is the uh, electronic sub-register system. Yes. So, I mean, we've put a lot of resourcing and our turnaround and service levels have been very good, which has enabled us to grow well above uh, system. But it sounds like we've fallen short on that particular uh, example. So we should definitely um, follow that up because I'm not aware and I haven't seen, unlike at, at times in the contact centre, as I said earlier, I haven't seen any delays in the in the back end of, uh, of mortgage uh, discharges. And Matt, do you find staff, you know, when you do get a complaint in, um, staff out in the branches and everything, and you, you go back and say, can you follow this up? I mean, are they keen to follow up? And do you get the feeling that they really want to make things right? And Oh, of course. I mean, the customer service ethos, I think, is very deep in CBA. And, I, you know, I think people who serve customers, you know, take delight in providing a really high-quality experience. And so, yes, I mean, the... the I, the nature of the number of customers that we serve, sometimes things do go wrong and, you know, people will write to me directly or they come through to my office or, uh, as you'd expect, and I uh, appreciate people also stop and pass things on and there's always uh, feedback and, and sometimes it's it's unexpected and, and, and that's actually really helpful, particularly if, we, you know, if it helps to sort of identify uh, a bigger problem. But, yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that, uh, you know, across the more than 40,000 people in CBA, how committed they are to serving their customers. And we're really lucky because, like all of our business customers that would be joining us, it's been very challenging for our staff as it has been for their staff yes. uh, over the last 18 months, both personally and, uh, and, and having to serve. You know, we've had people, we've been operating as an essential service right the way through lockdowns. You know, our teams are incredible at serving uh, in those areas, and we, I mean, we've obviously put all the protections and measures that we can. Um, but you know, it's it's been challenging at times for sure. And Mike, do you find that with especially with your new team of bankers that are out there in the branches in terms of dealing with complaints and, and just wanting to to get almost get ahead of things or try to? Ab ab absolutely, yeah. It's um, yeah. It's I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Um, Look, there's quite. I was, I was quite interested in the amount of interest that there was from some of your business customers in China, mm -hmm. and what's going mm -hmm. on in in China. A couple around uh, the Evergrande situation. Mm -hmm. This incredible construction company. Uh, how do, Victor says, how does the CBA see Evergrande impacting Australia? And uh, Ings asks, does the bank have any exposure to the China Evergrande debt? Yeah, that's, so the answer to the second one is no. Um, I mean, I, I think when the Evergrande situation was really escalating, um, we were obviously watching it very closely. We don't, I mean, we don't have a huge exposure as a, as a bank to China. We, de we definitely have customers, of course, that rely on that market. And we see that that's often where a lot of um, interest comes from. I've been in different parts of the country. I remember when I was in uh, Cairns in between the uh, lockdowns and meeting with our business customers. One of them had a, was... Um, uh, sugar cane and the sugar mill was Chinese, and so they all, you know, there's of course people see the the international connections with that market. Um, we don't see it, it, it having a, a big impact or any impact really at all in Australia. It's, it's clearly there's a lot of leverage uh, in that property market. Um, challenging situation for Evergrande and some of the uh, you know the creditors there, but we, we don't see that being an impact through to. Um, through to Australia, but you know, like anything, when you read through some of the things that have led to that, um, you know, it's it's always uh, worth factoring. So certainly, our risk team looked very, very closely at that. But fortunately, we don't see that having a, mm. an impact on CBA or Australia. And what about China more broadly? <laughs> Wendy asks uh, for your outlook on the Chinese trade relationship and how that's going to impact um, uh, Australian exports and when you hope it may improve? 
That's been a, I mean, look, that's been difficult. And um, Mike would be the same as we've both travelled separately and seen many customers all around the country. Um, you know, obviously changes and particularly. Uh, you know, some of the bans on different products, whether that was, uh, you know, some of the you know, rock lobster in WA, uh, wineries in South Australia, some of the, you know, the broader products. I think for many of our customers, um, we've also worked on just trying to make the business a bit more resilient. So businesses that were very reliant on a single market into China, very, very uncertain. But actually, you know, as they've had the opportunity and fortunately many of Australia's products, particularly in, you know, primary produce, um, are in strong demand. So it hasn't had a, hasn't had a big impact. Mm. Clearly, it's a challenging um, context uh, and the geopolitical uh, uh, outlook is an is an important consideration. It's, it's sort of hard for any of us to have a, a big impact on that and for a customer. But I do think it's something that you know businesses should be thinking about. I think it and is. It's not uncertain. easy for a business though to just suddenly flick to a completely different market in Asia, is it? It's it's not. Um, but it, you know sometimes if I guess if you have a concentration to you know a single client or a single supplier and whether that's you know in China or somewhere else, that obviously comes with risks. Often it comes with a you know, a premium. So, but I think many businesses have sort of looked at that and thought, well, I want to be maybe a bit more diversified. Um, and so I, th I think that's definitely been, um, you know, instructive, but we've seen, I mean, broadly, again, a lot of resilience across sectors that, at least on the face of it, look like they could have been quite significantly impacted. Now, Wendy, I think, is also interested in the property investment market. Uh, she says, do you see, uh, do you foresee the closure of the gap between unit prices and house prices in Sydney? Because it's quite dramatic, isn't it? It, it is. I mean, look, I think the uh, housing in Australia and many markets around the world have, have been very strong, um, particularly over the last 12 months. And look, that gap, there's always been a premium between obviously housing and, mm. uh, and, uh, and apartments. That, that premium has, has shifted um, because I think the demand, uh, at least in the near term, has shifted in favour of, of housing. Look, we're, we still believe the housing market will continue to perform uh, strongly, it, you know, if, if anything, it's been um, very strong in the last six months and we would expect some of the affordability constraints uh, to slow things down. Uh, be and do you think, do you think APRA, the regulator, is going to clip things a bit for, for investment, certainly for investment market? Yeah, look, I mean, our perspective has, has been, yes, I think we're, we're getting to the point where the increases that we've seen are... Uh, not sustainable um, and I think APRA obviously have been focused on that and, and made a change more recently um, that we and they would be particularly focused on seeing whether investors in particular and what the outlook will be so I, I think if the housing market doesn't slow it's likely that, that there would be uh, additional measures I think the so if you've got a bit of cash as a, as a, as a small business it's not necessarily uh, throw it into the investment property market, it'll going to continue to go up. Well, and this is another area. I mean, our economics team believes still there'll be uh, capital appreciation, obviously, more in different parts of the country over the next 12 months. But, I mean, rising interest rates, you know, by and large, should slow the increase in, in house prices. And I think we need to be realistic about, you know, many parts of the country when you're seeing... Uh, you know, asset price appreciation of more than 20% in some markets. And uh, that's that's a lot, but it's not limited to housing. Obviously, you know, we've seen uh, equities, uh, many uh, asset classes, you know, grow quite substantially over the last uh, 12 or 18 months. And I think that's more of the macro versus, uh, you know, we'd say, you know, prudential considerations, just very low cash rate uh, impacts the, the discount rate, which makes assets more valuable so people are prepared to pay more for them uh, yes and so I mean it's it's obviously a much better situation than the reverse with asset prices falling but I think they've risen uh, you know very sharply over the course of this year another big thematic this year is obviously ESG and we've just in the middle of this big meeting in Glasgow top cop 26 um, uh, needless to say there are several uh, comments here from small businesses uh, concerned broadly about 
CBA's position on fossil fuels. Uh, I've got one here from uh, Tristram, who says, what is CBA doing to withdraw from uh, financial support of fossil fuels? And, and James says, my wife and I are shareholders and have been customers for over 50 years. He's also a trustee of a super fund and office bearer and other organisations supporting the cessation of all finance or of new, for new or expanded coal mines and coal-fired power station. Why, he says, should I keep my funds with CBA? Well, I mean, importantly, to you, look, it's a really uh, important issue and, you know, realistically, it's going to be uh, a huge challenge for um, the world over to get to net zero. Uh, by 2050, which of course we are supported and committed to in line with the commitments we've made around Paris and limiting uh, climate change and temperature increases. Look, we set out very clearly in our annual report at any of our lending to uh, fossil fuels. Uh, they've consistently reduced uh, year on year and you can see that in our annual report. I mean, as a function of our overall balance sheet or our lending, it's less than 2%. So it's a very small part of our business. That said, we think it's really important that we're guided by the science and the steps that need to be taken. We're here to support customers and the Australian economy wherever possible to make that transition and to help customers decarbonise. I don't think at times it's as black and white as uh, you know, simply just withdrawing all financing from all of those sectors. We don't think that would be you know, appropriate and not in the country's best interests. But as I said, we've reduced our exposure. There's a lot of work that we are doing, both on the management of risks and, as I said, the fossil fuels for us is sort of less than 2% of our business. So why do you say it's not black and white? Because I think for a lot of people it is black and white, <coughs> isn't it? And, um, I mean, is it about our economic security? Is it about employment for a lot of these businesses, that they, they, they still employ people and there's no solution to that? Or I, Look, I think there's a, a number of important considerations. One, one of them is sort of energy security. And of course, we are uh, a you know, much bigger lender to renewable and very supportive uh, of the renewable energy transition. But there are you know, products like gas, for example, which are still critical to the electricity supply uh, in Australia. Um, but also, I mean, part of what we're doing, one of the things we announced just in the last couple of weeks um, was a partnership with CSIRO, which is the, the, the National uh, Science Agency. And you know, the advantage of that partnership from our perspective, obviously, we bring very significant understanding of all of our customers and, and they bring, uh, you know, a science-based approach and we're developing scenarios with them to make sure that you know, we can meet, uh, you know, limitation of or limiting uh, temperature increases to well below two degrees. Mm. Part of that will be modelling and work's been done um, by a number of different bodies trying to understand, and this tends to be an area which people are understandably focused on, what is the social uh, and economic transition? Not yeah. that that means that you shouldn't be taking more faster steps on the environmental and sustainable, but we have to also work out how to best support uh, those communities and parts of the economy with that transition. So, I mean, that's part of it, but we also see and look, um, within the business bank that Mike looks after, agriculture is such an important part of that. I mean, I think a big economic uh, contributor also, I think a, just a huge part of the fabric of Australian society. There's, I mean, there's... Mike, are, are your customers, agricultural customers, they're worried about? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um... It, it is, as Matt has, has said, we are we're working with Syra to see if there's um, in, innovative ways in which we can help the sector. The sector is is feeling the pressure, um, at, at, but it's not it's not just agriculture. It's uh, what what we've the, the view we've taken inside uh, the business bank is, is that um, this environmental issue is not just for large corporates. It's for it's for all business. Um, we do believe that small businesses too need to be able to understand their carbon their carbon footprint and what they can do about it. So we're making tools available to even small businesses to start tracking their carbon footprint and to start to just start engaging in the conversation mm. on the agri front um, lots of uh, we, lots of discussions we have holding heaps of discussions now with with farmers all over all over Australia um, we've got sustainable sustainable linked loans which we are working on um, right now with with quite a few farmers um, and to good traction I think there is a, a, a deep understanding of the challenge uh, now, let's move on to, to the pandemic itself, because 
Geraldine asks, um, again, it's a, it's, it's a question around support. During the pandemic, there's been support payments and free vaccinations for all, but the pandemic still has a huge impact on, on many lives. How will the world and governments recover financially after COVID and how will we get back to, you know, some sort of pre-pandemic world? I guess she's saying without that support. <clears throat> well, I mean, I think certainly from what we can see, uh, there's going to be a strong economic recovery uh, next year, I think 22 and 23. So, I mean, strong GDP, uh, you know, strong labour market or low unemployment, um, as we talked about. I mean, I think, I do think uh, particularly the implications will be, you know, long running in terms of, obviously, there's been a big change in, in the debt profile for many governments. There's been, you know, extreme uh, forms of unconventional monetary policy and... Uh, you know, bond purchases and quantitative easing. So I don't think anybody quite knows exactly how all of that sort of tapers and how we transition. But I mean, I, I think we have every reason to be very optimistic in Australia about the economic outlook here. Um, we're certainly very positive and, um, and hence why we, we want to support Australian businesses as best we can. And so, look, I think that it'll take some time. I think there'll probably be some, you know, some social elements that'll take some time as well. I think there's some really important lessons for all of us yes. from COVID as well. I think there's some, you know, some things that we sh should hold on to you know, from a business perspective. I know that's true of, uh, of CBA, but we also recognise that, you know, we've got to support businesses and the recovery will be uneven. And we can see that now there's still, obviously, in, you know, CBD, Sydney, where we are, but, you know, Melbourne will be the same. It's, you know, it's a long way back. It's been very tough because it's so, you know, the, the, the shift out of some of the CBD areas put a lot of pressure on. Yeah. Absolutely. Coffee shops and, and, uh, and hotels and bars. And well, that's about getting people back in the office, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> well, it's part of that. And I think, look, you know, we're starting to see some of that. I think people, you know, over the next few months in particular will be enjoying... You know, hopefully a, a good break and summer and Christmas and in, indulging in some, you know, some experiences, whether that's going to the out for dinner with friends or movies, the things yes. we haven't really been able to do. And so, but I, I, look, I, I've no doubt we'll make that uh, transition. I think there's a lot of sectors that will support Australia, agriculture, healthcare, energy, uh, infrastructure. Mm. Uh, what about fees? Because obviously that's another area that customers um, often bring up. Um, uh, and, and I think there's also there's, there's the level and then there's just understanding how they work, I think. Um, uh, merchant fees, credit cards. Uh, uh, Yatinda here says merchant fees are becoming a big cost for businesses as cash sales are dropping each day. There should be a cap that a small business will pay as a maximum. What's your view on that? Yeah, so a lot of work on, on, on in this topic, both innovation to our overall, you know, products and services, and Mike can talk in more detail about, you know, new merchant terminals that we're rolling out, but also we're changing our pricing. We've tried to simplify and streamline our pricing for in, for merchants. Um, where we waived tens of millions of fees during, the, during COVID, and we also had the opportunity to look very closely at the way we price in lots of different bundles and packages, and so we're going to a much simplified and at least the last time I checked, the, the, the cheapest in market, um, you know, at 1.1%. And so I think if we haven't looked at the pricing and products, it would definitely be worthwhile having a conversation um, with your banker at CBA. It's, it's an area we're hugely focused on and making sure we've got a great you know, integrated electronic payment proposition. We recognise that it's, you know, cash. Cash comes with a lot of other costs, which are often hidden yes. in terms of, you know, handling and transport, etc. Uh, electronic, you can see that. Actually, I, I do think overall the costs in Australia are very low relative to many other but are, markets. Is the bank working on trying to reduce credit card fees? Well, and credit card fees come in multiple forms. So yes. from a consumer, obviously, there's, there yes, can be fees or interest rates. Right. But, uh, I mean, from a business, typically, it's what the, the, the costs associated with acceptance of the credit card, yes. which, you know, for, for credit, it's generally set at about 50 basis points. It's a lot of, you know, lots of different price points. But, yes, overall, interchanges is something the Reserve Bank looks at very closely. And the cost to businesses continuing to come down and it's a competitive market which inevitably puts downward pressure on prices. And I think the, the Reserve Bank has now suggested that the buy now pay laters should be allowing um, the passing on of the surcharge. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. That's quite important for small businesses, isn't it, as well? 
Well, yeah, I think for a long time, the way the Reserve Bank has looked at uh, at interchange and also surcharging, yes. they basically say once something becomes essential, so, and you would say for most businesses, accepting, let's say, Visa and MasterCard uh, is essential, then businesses should be able to pass on the reasonable costs of that acceptance, which is otherwise known as surcharging. And you're quite right, Tiki, just in the last few weeks, the RBA has come out with a recommendation that says that uh, for buy now, pay later, which tends to be about, you know, in the order of five times more expensive, um, that if merchants are going to um, take that, then they should have the right to be able to to surcharge for that. Um, it's not currently uh, legislated, and there may be some resistance to that. Yes. Um, but you know, I, I think it's a. It must be coming, though, don't you think? Consistent policy yes. uh, posture, absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's one from Troy. Uh, we've been a customer for over 20 years, and at a time of severe financial difficulty, your bank deducts about 15 bucks regularly, even after the accounts have been brought up to date. Why is CBA still charging fees for insufficient funds in bank accounts that are rectified? I'm happy. I'm happy to take it to take that one. So just just remember that that it, that, um, that insufficient funds fee is for us to actually honour a payment. So what happens is is that um, we we actually allow the payment to go through, um, even though there's insufficient funds on that account. So there's a, a a risk assessment that happens at that point in time. So we don't return the payment. We actually allow the payment to happen. Mm which you have to fund, presumably. Yeah, yeah. so it's, a, it's, actually, it's actually a value add to the customer that we, we allow the payment to go through. OK, all right. Uh, look, let's move to uh, probably the most exciting area and the most difficult to understand, uh, which is innovation. And I was quite um, interested to see how many of the comments that have come through are actually about what you guys are doing uh, in, in innovation. So, um, and a particular interest, obviously, in crypto and, you know, the recent announcements. Um, so, um, here's um, Hasmuk. He says, why does it take five business day to make it, days to make an international money transfer? With advanced technology such as crypto, it only takes an hour at the most. Yeah, well, uh, coincidentally, Mark and I were going through the, the product roadmap. So, look, I'd say... Uh, for international money transfers. And like you said, Dickie, there's a lot of things that we've rolled out this year. And uh, fortunately, there'll be more next year as well. And particularly supporting businesses in terms of um, both, as we talked about, merchants tend to be uh, physical acceptance, but also e-commerce and electronic payments. It's such an important aspect of the way many businesses are serving uh, their customers, you know, international uh, money transfers, and Mike, you should add to that. I think being able to support our customers with their foreign currency needs and, of course, payments is a really um, important aspect of that. And we've got a number of different uh, innovations and features that we'll be, we'll be rolling out. And, and yes, look, I'm obviously happy to talk more about uh, crypto. It's certainly um, a topic that tends to polarise, and for those that are interested in it, they're incredibly engaged yeah. uh, in it. Yeah, but I mean, you're open to it, aren't you? Well, what we announced uh, very recently was that we would uh, start piloting the ability for customers to buy crypto on our Combank mobile app. Yeah. Um, it is a very volatile investment. Um, we've seen a lot of demand from uh, people all around the country. We think it is about 8% or so of Australians that are invested, another 5% really? are thinking about it. I mean, yeah. just, if you work that through, that's about 2 million people, so it's quite strong. Uh, and, and what about security around it? I mean, there's a question here from Mark. What progress is being made in the area of cyber... cyber sorry, this is, this is about cyber, not about crypto. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what progress is being made there, and are there... You know, how do you, how do you um, uh, uh, really get to getting a hold of the scammers uh, and apprehending them um, and how much cooperation is there between you guys and the other banks around all this sort of stuff? Because that's such an important part of innovation and digital and... It, it is. I mean, a couple of different points. Obviously, there's a lot of work uh, for us on uh, fraud detection mm -hmm. and helping both our personal and business customers uh, to absolutely um, support them and because I think a, a part of the pro our pro overall proposition is being, you know, the, the Commonwealth Bank and... Uh, safe, trusted uh, organisation. And of course, we want to help our customers minimise any of that 
uh, fraud. We've seen a big, unfortunately, big increase in scams and fraud generally during COVID. Um, and so we're, you know, I guess we're very alert to that, trying to work very closely with customers, particularly on the consumer side or personal customers, people yes. who are purporting to be all sorts of things that they're not. Um, you know, from technicians to, you know, representing companies that they don't or, you know, they and can... Just emails and phishing and... Correct. Emails, SMS, pretending to be like a, a delivery. We've seen examples where, you know, businesses have been hacked, uh, their invoices are uh, amended and the payment instructions, instead of being their bank details, they're someone else's. So when something goes wrong <coughs> with, you know, say you're a small business and you get hacked, um, do you have a process that you can just rush in and assist and help? We do. I mean, look, there's a range of different ways that we try to support businesses. And I, and I think it's something that we're looking at to say, is there more that we can do? Because obviously, as the Australia's largest bank, we're making a lot of investments in protecting ourselves and our customers. Yes. Uh, it's very complex and very expensive. And so I think from our perspective, it's how could we make some of those serv services available to others? I mean, the most important thing, of course, for a customer is to notify their bank. Uh, if, they, if they suspect anything, there's obviously, if there's been payments made, we're much better chance of being able to recover those payments if we can get, you know, immediate notification, even though there's real-time payments sometimes. And this is where the banks and, you know, a variety of agencies work closely together is to try and help and facilitate, recover funds if, if customers have been uh, scammed. I'm sure, Mike, you must have seen you know, big increases over the course of the last 12 months. Absolutely. There. Um, also, we just we just making customers more aware of the tools that they have available. Pay ID is an example um, to make sure you're paying the, who you think you are paying. Um, we do have tools. We do have capability. Um, as we, as Matt alluded to, as we as we take um, uh, our customers more uh, more, e more into into e-commerce more. We find we are having a lot more conversations around cybersecurity and how we can help them, um, and the tools that we can we can we can bring to the bring to the party to facilitate a safe uh, yeah. safe. And now coming back to crypto, Pat Pat asks, you know, uh, crypto is promoted as a safe and secure high gain investment across a range of media forums. Uh, how do you feel about that, Bitcoin? And yeah, I wouldn't describe it in those terms. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why we've entered it is we think there's definitely a place, I think, for people to invest in crypto through a safe, secure brand. And we've chosen, I won't go through all the details, but some international partners which we think deliver a very safe and secure service. But I mean, I think we should be realistic at this point in time. And look, we think the application of uh, distributed ledger uh, technology and Crypto is absolutely here to stay. How it evolves, you know, we're unsure, but unquestionably, there's you know huge investment and there's some real innovation. Mm. But it's a volatile investment, and so one of the things from our perspective, which we make clear uh, for customers who would participate, is that it's the sort of investment that you should only make, uh, or the amount that you're prepared to lose. And I mean, at the moment, as we were talking about earlier, Tiki, everything's going up. Uh, every, you know, asset classes, and I think we, you know, we've all seen this before. And you know, everything looks easy uh, when everything's going up. And look, maybe it will, but you know, there's inevitably a, there's a pullback. There's a couple of questions about the RBA sort of getting into uh, digital crypto uh, currency. Um, Jeffrey asks, how will blockchain technology affect money transfer internationally? As the recent news revealed that the RBA is considering adopting a blockchain that may reduce money transfer fees and Mahesh says when could we expect digital currency to come into effect in Australia and do you envisage that traditional currency will disappear? Yeah, I look on the latter point I don't envisage it will disappear certainly anytime soon. I, many central banks all around the world and the RBA is uh, uh, similarly is investing resources and time thinking about central bank digital currencies and so what's a electronic version of the physical cash and mm. uh, that we're that we're used to we're working with the central bank on this public on the wholesale uh, central bank digital currency which is more of an interbank uh, transfer I think there's probably a degree of inevitability or I think it would be sensible to be starting to you know to develop uh, what that could look like there's lots of different ways it could be designed um, and we do think, as I said, you know, blockchain or distributed ledger technology, um, you know, companies like the ASX, which is the, you know, they're doing a big uh, distributed ledger implementation, that sort of technology has lots of uh, applications. And, 
we can see that uh, being a more efficient way to to make a, you know a variety of different um, processes simpler and and cheaper for customers over time. So, mm. from our perspective, it's about making sure that we're on the leading edge uh, of innovation for our customers, bringing those products to market. Of course, building capability and then. Uh, being able to make sure that we're at the forefront of, uh, of technology for our customers. Now, what about backing the innovators? Mm -hmm. uh, MIFTA says that, you know, how does CBA enable and support early stage Australian startups to grow? What are you doing there? Well, I mean, Mike, you should talk about the business growth fund. I mean, we're, we're, other than in businesses that are central to CBA, which we, we have a number of equity partnerships, we don't provide equity financing sort of per se. That's not our business model. Um, but, you know, we are conscious and, you know, I'll let Mike expand on the sort of business growth fund which is set up to be able to provide early stage. Yeah, so we're a participant in the Australia Business Growth Fund. In fact, the first investment made out of the fund was to a CBA um, customer. We've invested $100 million in the fund along with our, 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 our host of the, the, other, the other big four banks and, and others. Um, it is a, it is, the fund is designed to look for exactly this, for equity funding opportunities in early stage growth And that's, that's across sectors, presumably. It's it's across all sectors, yeah, yeah most sectors. I, I, I don't, it doesn't play an egg, but pretty much, um, pretty much all but other. Sort of health and finance and all, all sorts of things. But it's not, it's not just about access to to, to finance for, for early stage businesses. It's, it's about getting businesses set up quickly and taking the red tape out of that process. So allowing them to register the company um, with with ASIC, allowing them to get you know, sorted with the ATO. Um, giving them the ability to make and receive payments quickly. These are things that we are staring into all the time to make that, that process as, as quick, intuitive and easy as possible. Because I think that's quite important. I mean, George here, he says, you know, these people, we have ideas, uh, but what policies does the bank have uh, in relation to entrepreneurs and startup to help support them just when they're getting started out? So you're saying this is exactly... It's, it's abs that whole value proposition around making it easy. For, there's, there's a whole lot of things to worry about when you're, when you're an entrepreneur and a and you're starting up a company. So we want to make that as easy as possible yeah. um, to take out all the pain and the, the, the anxiety out of it. So whether it be registering a company, dealing with the ATO, getting yourself online to make and receive payments, that's, that's how we're helping now. I'm really interested, Matt, in the different ways the big banks have gone about their own innovation their own digital, because it's very different, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, you've mm -hmm. obviously led the way at CBA. Um, you started earliest, but you've also made sure it's very much a sort of uh, an organic, you know, very much built out of the bank. You're not using another, uh, another organisational partnering very much, are you? Well, I mean, we're, what we are, I guess we want to build out and have the most uh, innovative and best technology experience for our customers. And I think for business customers, just helping them run their business uh, better. There's a number of different ways. Some of it we're building ourselves. Some of it is software that we're integrating. We've bought a couple of companies and we've integrated a business proposition and healthcare and hospitality as a couple of examples. We have partnered. Uh, we want to basically provide the, you know, the best holistic business banking experience to you know, the majority of Australian businesses if we can. We, we see it as a critical engine room of the economy and we want to be at the forefront of technology partnering with businesses that are inevitably trying to do the same for themselves. Just to add, we met, we, 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 we met ended there. I think the wonderful opportunity we have is to create a marketplace for our customers. So we've got 11 million uh, retail customers, a million business customers. If we can create a market where we can provide low-cost quality leads to our business customers, I mean, that's one of the best things that you could do for a startup is to give them to create a market for them. Yeah. And that's, that's our ambition is to create this ecosystem that we have inside CBA. And at the other end of the spectrum, your incredibly long, loyal customers, do you do anything special for them or is it... Yeah, I mean, it's a big focus for us, and Mike, you should talk about that, because loyal, certainly the way we think about it, of course, you know, price plays a role. Yes. I think the service proposition also plays a role. And, you know, I think particularly from a business customer, as much as most businesses are happy to talk about their business, they tend to not want to have to repeat it too much. And so, you know, having a business and a bank and a banker or a team that understands the longevity is able to support that. And I think... You know, importantly for us as well, it's supporting businesses as we have, um, which has really helped us over the last 18 months through a difficult period. Mm -hmm. Part of why our growth has been very strong relative to market and peers is because you know, other businesses have come to us because of 
course, you know, many successful businesses have had some, you know, some pretty difficult moments. You tend to really remember the institutions mm. uh, that stood by you when, when you needed that help. And, you know, fortunately, many of them have gone on to be very, very successful. And hopefully we've played some sort of role in that. And Matt, just to finish up, I mean, I guess many of your business customers have, have been to hell and back over this period. Uh, you've moved in, the banks have moved in to, to, to support, but you're really quite glass half full going forward now. You, you, you genuinely feel that uh, this is the time that, that, that we are turning the corner. Because you're growing business, aren't you? You're, you're growing business customers and you're... A absolutely. As I said to you, it's been our, our best sort of 12 months we've had. Uh, and obviously that's against a pretty difficult, uh, you know, economic and social backdrop for many of our, of our businesses. So we're absolutely there supporting them. And, you know, we've been very pleased and I know our staff very, uh, very proud to be able to support Australian businesses through that difficult period and to see so many of them come out the other side. And I, I do think there's a very substantial sort of economic tailwind that's going to come through over the next uh, couple of years, I think we'll see consumer and business confidence continue to pick up. I think we'll go through a, you know, a very positive period over over the break, um, and I think we should all be looking forward to a, you know pretty robust ec economic conditions over mm -hmm. the next year, and hopefully a lot less uncertainty. Uh, I think the uncertainty is really weighed, you know, on many people and not knowing when they'll be able to open or not, and exactly what situation. And right. so, you know, fortunately, you know, the vaccination rollout and has, has been you know, staggeringly successful. Um, and so, look, I, we certainly finished the year or whatever, four or five weeks away from finishing the year, uh, you know, very optimistic about the year ahead. Do you want to add anything more? I think we're probably just out of time now. That might be a, it might be a good note to finish, but thank you uh, very much for the opportunity. Yeah, well, Matt and Mike, thank you very much. I hope you found this uh, really useful and interesting. It's the first time it's been done. Uh, and so thank you for everyone who sent through questions for Matt. A replay of the forum will be available on combank.com.au forward slash CEO. And a special thank you to everyone for watching the forum live. We appreciate your time. Uh, you'll receive a feedback survey in the next few days. Good night.